Hey Rangers, Commander Jared here. I'm going to be teaching you guys the first aid merit. This is going to go into either two or three parts, uh, depending on how quickly we are able to get through the material. So if you don't know who I am, my name is Jared Silverman. I'm a nationally registered paramedic and a board certified flight paramedic. I also teach pre-hospital medicine at a college in the Northeast region in New York. So with that, let's get right into the merit. You're going to want to open up to your workbook or your printed sheet of the first aid skills merit. And we're going to be starting right on page W1, uh, right at question one. So this is asking to explain the meaning of first aid. Now, first aid in its most basic form is care given to a sick or injured patient to stabilize and keep them safe until uh, higher level medical professionals can work on them, such as EMTs or paramedics. So your job as a first aider is to keep a patient safe and stabilized until we get on scene. Now, there's a primary assessment that I've typed up. There's also one in your notebook. The one in your notebook is a little outdated based on newer research, so we're going to be using the one that I typed up. You guys can pause the video as I move it closer so that you can screenshot it or write it down. So let's start with our primary assessment. The first thing you want to keep in mind is safety. Safety is the number one concern whenever giving first aid. This is so that you keep yourself safe so that you can go and treat patients. If you're injured, then there's no use and you won't be able to treat somebody. So you want to keep your safety in mind and that's paramount. So ensure the scene is safe and you also have gloves. Right here I have some nitrile gloves that we carry on the ambulance. You're going to want to put these on before coming in contact with any body, bodily fluids from your patient. So that's the red stop sign on the top right. Next, it goes directly into responsiveness. So that's going to be our first mnemonic, RAP, R-A-P. And for responsiveness, we're going to want to walk up to our patient and ask them if they're okay. If they look like they're not doing well, you can simply tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, are you doing okay? Do you need help? If they say, no, I'm fine, then you can simply walk away and go about your day. But if they don't respond or if they say they do need help, then you're going to move down to the next square, which is A, and that's activate 911. We want to activate 911 as soon as possible and as soon as we see that there's an emergency occurring. This is so we can organize all our units and get care to the patient as quick as possible. After you call 911, you're going to want to check the patient position. If they're in an unsafe area, you're going to want to move them. Now, you'll also note in the top right corner that there's a gray square that says if there's a suspected spinal injury, do not move the patient. Now, if you move the patient that has a spinal injury, you might make them worse or cause more harm to them. So you don't want to move them. Now, there is a little side note to this. It says unless the patient's life is threatened. Now, we say life over limb, which means if the patient is going to die right in front of you, Regardless of whether they have a spinal injury, you're going to want to move them from that scene to save their life. So after patient position, we're going, to, we're going to get into the main part of the primary assessment, which is the mnemonic MARCH. Um, and so our first letter is M in MARCH, and that stands for massive hemorrhage. So you're going to ask yourself, is there any massive bleeding on this patient? That just means any kind of massive bleeding that's flowing really fast or spurting. We'll get into how to treat this later, but if there is massive bleeding, you're going to want to apply direct pressure and then put on a tour tourniquet. We'll also get into that later. If there is no massive hemorrhage or the bleeding is controlled, then you can move down to A, which is the next letter in a mnemonic, and that stands for airway. So you're going to ask yourself, is the airway blocked? And we're going to get into how you can assess whether the airway is blocked later, um, but basically, if it is, yes you'll move to the right, and you're going to encourage the patient to cough. If they can't cough, or it's not working, you're going to wind up performing the Heimlich maneuver. We'll also get into how, how to do that later. If the airway is not blocked, or you fixed it, we're going to move down to the next letter in the mnemonic, which is R, and that stands for respirations. So you're going to ask yourself, is the victim breathing? If they're not, you're going to reposition the patient, because they're and that could be compressing their trachea or their larynx, which could be closing their airway. So repositioning them can help open that up uh, if they're breathing on their own. If they're still not breathing, we're going to move directly to C, and that's circulation. 
Also, if they are breathing, we're going to move directly to circulation and we don't need to reposition the patient. So once we move to C, which is circulation, we're going to check if the victim has a pulse. If, if the victim is conscious, most likely they're going to have a pulse. And you can just assess on the conscious patient the radial pulse to see what the quality is. On an unconscious patient, patient who's lying down and not awake, you're going to want to assess the carotid pulse, which is in the neck. So to find that, you're going to look for the larynx or the Adam's apple, and you're going to just move directly to the side until you get to the little notch in your neck. Right here, you'll find the carotid artery. You can leave your hand like this, or you can switch it like this if you want. And you're going to hold that there for 10 seconds to feel a pulse. Once you feel a pulse, we're going to move on to our next one. But if you don't feel a pulse after 10 seconds, you're going to need to begin CPR if you're trained and you're going to need to find adult assistance, adult assistance or somebody who knows CPR. Now, if they do wind up having a pulse, you can move directly to our last letter in the mnemonic, which is H. That stands for hypothermia. So most patients who have, who are in a shock state or if it's a trauma patient, we'll get into what that means later, they can lose a lot of heat or be affected by subtle losses of heat. Hypothermia is one of the three killers in a shock or trauma patient, and we're going to want to keep them warm. So after we finish keeping them warm, we're going to move directly to the right where it says keep patient safe move to, and move to secondary assessment. We're going to learn how to do our secondary assessment later. So the next thing we're going to want to go over um, is actually from the beginning of our assessment, and it has to do with activating the 911 system. So there's four pieces of information that you're going to want to give to the 911 operator so that they can relay that information to responders coming in. This can help them be prepared for uh, whatever they need to find on scene. So those four pieces of information is going to be one, your name, two, the emergency that's occurring, three, the location of the emergency, and four, the patient's condition. Like I said, this is going to help the incoming responders. So with that, let's get right into some different uh, medical states that we might find um, and some things that we might have to wind up treating. So the first thing that we're going to go over is hypovolemic shock. Now for hypovolemic shock, first we're going to want to define what shock actually is. Now this is a state in the body where we're not pumping enough uh, blood or nutrients to the tissues. This can also be defined as hypoperfusion. And, the first, and we're going to go over two types of shock. First is going to be hypovolemic shock, like I mentioned before, and the second is going to be anaphylactic shock. Now let's start with hypovolemic shock. So hypovolemia means a loss of fluid. Now this can be from excessive bleeding, excessive vomiting, or diarrhea. This is inherently when somebody loses too much fluid. So what we're going to want to do to these patients as first aiders, because you don't have the necessary drugs or medications that you need to administer to them, but there are some things that you can do. And that's going to be covering them with a blanket and keeping them warm. Like we mentioned before, hypothermia is one of the main killers in a shock patient. So keep them warm by uh, covering them with a blanket, uh, some other insulation, or moving them to a uh, area that has a temperature greater than 84 degrees. Because even at room temperature, patients can still lose a lot of heat and it can be detrimental to their out outcome. Um, some of you, being campers and, and rangers that we are, might know what survival blankets are. These things were great, or so we thought. So these are actually not recommended anymore um, because they do not reflect body heat like we thought they used to. They only reflect UV, uh, UV rays, and our body is not emitting UV rays. That's not how we emit heat. So this does not reflect heat, and it's not used for hypothermia or the prevention of it. So the only time we'll ever use something like this is when there's wind around and we have to prevent, uh, prevent uh, loss via wind. So you can either use something like this or a plastic bag, but to keep somebody warm, this is not going to reflect their body heat, so we need some kind of insulation. Next, let's go into anaphylactic shock. So anaphylactic shock, some of you actually at home might have this, and you might be carrying an EpiPen or be allergic to something. Anaphylactic uh, shock is caused when you come in contact to something you're allergic with, whether that may be uh, a bee sting or something that you eat that you're allergic to. So in, when you come across a patient like this, um, you're going to want to follow their instructions. They know this, the, uh, the illness that they have, and they're going to know how to treat it. If they can't help you, maybe you can find a friend or a family member um, and 
If you can't find that either, then the 911 operator will be able to tell you what to do. So this concludes part one of the video. We're going to move straight on to part two. Uh, you can find that in the next upload. Um, this might wind up turning into a three-part video, as uh, first aid is a lot of information. So stay tuned for part two and part three. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Peace